So welcome again to the practical class. Um, in the chat, you will see the link to the uh, file with the uh, problems which were started last time. Uh, for those watching on YouTube, I will post the link in the down in the video. OK, okay. so which problems from the first exercise sheet would you like to discuss first? How, how, what, what, what would you like? Uh, hello, I oh. wanted to talk about uh, task nine. Nine, yeah. So nine was the most interesting one of that, uh, yes. because it was a, actually a theoretical question, which was, uh, in a sense, uh, smuggled to the seminar class just to save time on lectures. So it's a theoretical question. Let me uh, first remind it. So we should construct a three CNF. So it should be three a conjunctive normal form. It should be a three CNF. For which saturation process gives us an exponential blow up. Uh, the formulation is a bit more complicated because here we um, say that this should be a series of formulae of growing size. So if we have a concrete CNF, well, it's just fixed finite size. And how can you say that it's exponential? No way. OK, you have you had 10 and yielded 1000. Is it exponential or is polynomial? Nobody knows. Uh, so here for each n, you should construct um, a formula and uh, the growth should be exponential after saturation. OK, so does anyone want to show how this is solved? If yes, please uh, speak up. If not, then I will show how it is uh, just this example. It's quite interesting. No, no one solved it, but uh, well, this is actually a pity because uh, it's not that hard, but it's quite interesting. So uh, let me introduce the following variables first. So we have P. We have R. And we have Q1, Qn. So here the number of uh, variables is n plus 2. So roughly speaking, it's n. And uh, we're going to construct a CNF, which is linear in this size, so it has also, roughly speaking, n clauses. And uh, its saturation will be um, exponential. So what is the main idea? The main idea is that uh, inside these uh, clauses, you will have, say, some qi and some not QJ. And when you saturate it, you will get clauses which will include something like Q1 or not Q2 or Q3, etc. So which will include all possible combinations of uh, Qs and their negations. This will be the idea. And this will give us exponential blow up because we're 2 to the power of n. OK. So the clause actually will include the following. So what is this 3 CNF? I'll write it in another color. I don't know which. Blue. OK. So this will be to say the following clauses. P or QI or not R. This will be the first series of clauses where I 1 to N. And uh, the other one will be J of P. Here J is also from one to N. Of course, this is not a unique example. It's just one example which I introduced for this class specifically. OK, so let's see what will happen if we try to apply resolution here. I will write it in red. OK. So let's resolve. Let's say resolve this one. P 
for q1 or r as q2 here not r and here we'll have r or q1 negated or p what will happen if we resolve this how do you think uh, yes it will be p or q2 or q1 not q1 or or that's all yeah, that's all okay or not q1 so yes um yes okay oh sorry yeah i i, I, I will i will have to uh put here not p and here will be also not p and here will be not p yeah this is important otherwise we fail what happened here so you see that okay actually this is a not a, that that good example because actually it's trivial because here's p or not p this is true but formally speaking uh this guy will um you see that the idea here is that uh in the middle you will have this stuff and now you can extend it you have this p and you have not p here and now you can again resolve this against say p or q3 or not r and this will give us p or q2 or not q1 or q3 or not r right so you see that this central part it, it starts growing and here you can find out an arbitrary thing actually you can find out an arbitrary list of uh variables so q yeah q2 q3 but you can also have q2 q5 or something like that so you can have an arbitrary subset of this set and there are exponential number of such sets okay of course, yes, an example is a bit degenerate in the sense that it includes actually tr uh, trivially true stuff. And uh, by the way, when you try set here, saturation does some strange thing. It uh, adds uh, clauses which actually are weaker than the clauses in the original CNF. So uh, this could be asked for you for, uh, say, one week more of thinking. Uh, whether you can do this in a non-trivial situation where the um, uh, you the new uh, clauses are not not trivial because here one can say okay but we can add uh, an extra check which says that if our clause includes an old clause we also do not add this right because if a clause is something like you have a or b but you have already a then you can remove a or b because it's uh, meaningless a is stronger here this happens actually but e even without that you can have exponential blow up and please think about this in a week maybe we'll return to this problem and talk about this okay more questions or more problems you want to discuss from the uh, previous exercise sheet I would like to ask you actually, should we discuss right now uh, the standard exercises from it? So I would like to discuss four because we, I believe we didn't do it and it's important. And I would like maybe to discuss five and we did five B and I would like to discuss five A. But what about one, two, three, six, seven, eight? Does anyone want to discuss them or is it easy? And uh, understandable because they're, they're technical writing this down on the jamboard is uh, quite a mess but uh, on the other side they are they do not have a they should not uh, cause any problems actually so what was your opinion it was everything okay with uh, these numbers so okay, maybe but, a number was okay, but there could be other people who had problems with them 
Okay, let's then start with number 5a, and then we'll go uh, and uh, for further ones uh, if people want. So let's try 5a. I will recall the formulation here. So the formulation is as follows. You should construct a formula A such that the following equivalence is held. R implies A should be equivalent to R implies P of Q. Yep, the brackets are put like that. And uh, A implies R should be equivalent to P uh, not P of Q implies R. And we just construct a formula which satisfies these equivalences. So equivalence means that these guys are true under the same assignments. Does anyone want to show how it is solved? Okay, if nobody did this, I will do it myself. Just to show, okay, some people write in the chat. Um, where is it? By using table. Okay, please show. Please show. You can write on the Jamboard. People doing this. Okay. So someone wrote the truth table, and uh, I would ask the person who wrote this just to comment somehow, maybe by voice or in chat or somewhere else. What's, what, what did happen? Well, how was this uh, constructed? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Um, okay, uh, I wrote the formulas in order to make them more simpler to um, make a table. And then we know that uh, the uh, right side is equivalent to the le left side. Uh, I wrote the, the ones and zeros for um, the right sides of the formulas and uh, put the same numbers uh, in the columns uh, with the left sides. And then I um, found an A uh, which uh, satisfy the Mm, they needed the uh, numbers in uh, both columns, uh, not R or A, and not A or R. And then uh, I uh, uh, made a SDNF by using this table, and A is uh, just as SDNF. Yes, this is a possible way of doing that, maybe not the optimal one. Uh, so the easier way is as follows. So, okay, oh, you can just consider, by the way, two cases. Uh, if you uh, say here, put R equals 1, then you will see that here you have just 0 or A. So in this case, you will have that A should be equivalent to P or Q, right? And if R equals 0, then here you will have not A equivalent to this guy, right? P and not Q. So this means that A is equivalent to not P or Q, right? And then you just say that what happens? You just have to glue this up. And the formula will be as follows. It will be A 
is R and P O Q, or R should be zero, so we're not R and not P O Q. Yeah, th this is a shorter form of this thing. Is that clear? The first solution is also okay, but it's a bit more tedious. You should check all this stuff. Okay, now let's try four. Um, let's try four C. It's easy task, uh, and I hope that some of you did it. Uh, but it's just interesting in a sense. So, by the way, four B. It was the majority function, and it was on the lecture. So it's voting at least two out of three vote four. So 4B, you can see it on the slides of the lecture, for example. There is an example. 4C, A should be true if and only if an odd number of PQR are true. So either all of them are true, all three, <coughs> or exactly one is true. Who could write down the, the formula? In any way, using DNF or using uh, anything goes. Yes, exactly. It's actually the full DNF. It could, got up, be, could be obtained from the truth table. But here we have just, we know what are the true lines here. The true lines are either all ones. These are here uh, on the right. So either exactly one should be true. It could be P, it could be Q, and it could be R. OK, so just easy. OK, so now a question for you. Does anyone want to discuss any other problems from the first exercise sheet? Because if not, we'll go for the, for the next one. If yes, then please speak up or put in the chat and we'll discuss it. OK, something here. 6C. OK, let's do it. Yes, 6C is good and uh, it's not that easy. So let's, uh, let's try to do it. 6C, let me write down the formulation of it. That's a big number of brackets here. And also 8B. Okay, let's first try 6C. So this is bracket, 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 bracket. Then it should be P implies Q. Implies not P. Implies not Q. Implies not R. Implies R. Okay, so translate into DNF and CNF. Who wants to try at least one of this? CNF or DNF? Okay. No, 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 this doesn't look right, because here these are all nested, so the conjunction and disjunction should somehow alternate. So this is the disjunction, right? This implication should be transformed as a conjunction, this is okay. But here we have two problems. So the first one, that this Q should be positive, I no, no, negative, I believe, because it's under two in, under two negations, right? This not Q should keep being not Q. And this, uh, the third from the right implication should transform again to a disjunction, right? 
So the idea was right, but let let us uh, understand what's going on. So it's okay. Let, let me solve it uh, for you. So it's by the way, uh, it, yeah, so this stuff is de designed to be scary, but it's much easier than you could suppose. Let me make some notations. What happens here? This is a scary, scary, scary part. So actually the answer which was given, it was right. It, it really are. So let's call this, I don't know, D. And you have the following formula. You have D implies not R. Implies R. And actually everything happens as it was shown before. R or the negation of this, right? What is the negation of this? It's again R and not D. Correct? Okay, now let's look at that. What is it equivalent to? So, okay, you will ha you have a disjunction. You have just R and you have R and something. What is easier to satisfy? If this bracket is true, Yeah, it's just R. It's just exactly R. Because the bracket has R. And therefore, in the disjunction, it will be weaker. So, again, if R is true, then this is obviously true because it's disjunction. And if this is true, then of course R should be true because each component of the disjunction includes R. So it's just equivalent to R. And this is the answer to both questions because uh, it says, okay, Provide a DNF, provide a CNF, but just a literal, it's a clause, both a CNF clause, a DNF clause, and it's a, it itself is a, a CNF and also a DNF. So being scary, this problem is actually easy. And also people asking to um, do, I don't remember what, 8B. Okay, let's try 8B. So 8B. Transform negation into the CNF and use resolution method. Yeah, so we'll practice in resolution method. So this is P implies Q. Uh, this implies R implies not P. And this implies not Q implies R. Okay, who wants to translate it into a CNF? Also 2C. Okay, let's uh, let's start with. Uh, let's uh, first do 8B and then 2C. Okay. If someone wants to transform it into a CNF, please start. ROQ, exactly. Or Uh huh, and you should put some brackets, I think, here also. No, it's not P on it's P or P and R, right? Oh, e, or oh, not? So let, let's check. So okay, yes, no, you, you, these these are not necessary. So what do we have here? We have to negate this guy. No, but this R is bad here, and this Q is you. You didn't negate it. Ah, you, you just it's just the formula itself. Okay, so you have R, you have uh, not or this or a negation of this Q or negation of this. So how to negate this? You should say that P should be no. Should, this guy should be negated. The left hand side should be negated. How to negate an implication? You should postulate the. Yes, okay, it's, 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 it's right, yes. So one not doesn't imply zero. So this guy is not P or Q. Then this is R here, and this is negation of the Q. Right, okay, now we should negate this and obtain a, a negation of the formula. Mm -hmm.
Mm, I think we've forgotten something. Aha. Yes, because you removed P and not P. So by distributivity, you will have something with Q and something with not P, but just not P will give you uh, false and disjunction rule. Okay. And this is, by the way, a CNF. Okay. Now what? How can we apply resolution method and uh, find a satisfying assignment? So the problem here is as follows. So no resolutions applicable, right? What does this mean? No ways to resolve something, exactly. But, yes, R equals Q equals zero and P is arbitrary. If you cannot apply any resolutions, this means that your uh, CNF is satisfiable because there's no uh, contradiction, there's no bad clause. If your CNF is satisfiable, well, you can find a satisfying assignment. And here R and Q are dictated to be zero, P could be arbitrary. And if you substitute this here, if you say R and Q are zero, then this formula is going to be false because its negation is true. And therefore the original formula is not a tautology. This is how it's solved, right? And the next what was asked, it was to see. Okay, let's try to see. So 2C was, uh, is this formula satisfiable? Oh, yeah. So Q implies uh, P and R, uh, then and not P or R implies Q. Okay. Does anyone want to solve that? Is that satisfiable? By any method. You can try resolution, you can try something more standard, just guessing where it is satisfiable. One more, one more bracket. Okay, yeah, the formula is satisfiable by, say, the following assignment. Actually, a crucial part here is that uh, Q should be zero. And at least one of the P or R should be zero. Because if Q is zero, then we automatically satisfy the left-hand side. Zero implies anything. And here we have not that this implies zero. And in order to this to be false, here is zero on the right, and here we'll have one. So. Say if P and R are both one that is satisfied, even if one of them is one is also satisfied. So it's satisfiable one. Okay. More questions of this exercise sheet because we're now moving to the next one. Okay, then I will uh, show the next exercise sheet. So here it's on the screen, but I will also copy the link to the uh, chat because we'll uh, move to Jamboard right now and uh, this is, should be here. 
So as advertised on today's lecture, this is a task on first order predicate logic. So uh, just some basics uh, throughout this exercise sheet, the variables which range over non-empty domain M and predicate symbols they range over predicates. So the K array functions from M to zero and one. K is a number of arguments. And again, here there are many um, interesting things. So from uh, each of these, we'll solve one, maybe two, and others will come for our home task. So, uh, yeah, we have some, some time still left. So let's uh, slowly uh, begin with uh, to today's thing. OK, so. Uh, let us start with um, maybe the first one. So first order, okay. Mm, where is my yeah. So maybe someone wants to solve something from the first, say first A. Let me write it down on the Jamboard also. First A, predicate logic. Uh, for all x, uh, p of x, or q of x. Does that imply that for all x, p of x, or for all x, q of x? And the question is whether this is generally true for any interpretation of p and q on any set. How do you think? Is this true for all assignments? Or are there any variants for which this is false? So recall that P and Q, I'll write it like this with the circumflex, it means that this is this is interpretations. They should be interpreted as uh, form this predicates, so they take objects and return zeros and ones. So at each object, P is either true or false, and also at each object independently, Q is either true or false. And the question is, is that formula which is written on top, is it always true? Well, I understand the problems with this with such sort of tasks. They are more creative than the previous ones. So here, okay. Yes. Do you mean that it is generally true? So, yeah, no, but no, no. Any X is here before the formula. So you have this is a, so you have uh, here, uh, this is uh, the left hand side of the implication, this is the right hand side of the implication. I understand the problems here because unlike uh, previous tasks with Boolean logic where everything could be actually solved by writing down the corresponding truth tables and understanding whether generate true or false and all other methods were just optimizations actually for that. Here we should think a bit because the interpretations could be infinite. But in this task, as I noticed on the lecture, we have only unary predicate. So actually uh, everything is also, actually, everything is finite because there are a finite number of possibilities for P and Q. So what do we have? We can say that suppose for all X, P of X or Q of X. What does that mean? Does it entail the right hand side? Well, what does this mean? It means that if we take a particular X, then we uh, have two situations. Either we have P here, that P is true, or for another X, X prime, we have Q. P of X and Q of X prime. Okay, let's now read what is going on on the right. What does it mean that for all X, P of X? It means that any X should satisfy P. Okay. P of X is true for any X. 
or q of x is true for any x. This is the right hand side. But on the left hand side, it's a different situation that for any x, it should be either p or q, or maybe both. So you see that the left hand side is weaker. There could be possible situations where p is true somewhere and q is true somewhere. And but the none of uh, neither P nor Q is true everywhere. And you could try something like that. So you could try a model where M includes only two elements, A and B. So here you have A, here you have B, and you have P of A, not P of B, not Q of A, and Q of B. You can assign the um, truth values like this, right? And then you will have uh, the following. Your uh, left-hand side of the implication is true, and your right-hand side of the implication is false. Therefore, this implication is false. Right? Okay, and let's now, because I did it myself, let's now try to be one B. The same presupposition. But it implies a bit different thing. For all X P of X, or exists x q of x. So I believe that all of you understand that the first one a was false. No, no, not generally true. Is this true? Is this generally true? How do you think? Is this not generally true? Okay, if it is not generally true, then you should uh, suggest uh, an interpretation where it is falsified, as in Boolean logic, as an assignment where it's falsified. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. This is a disjunction here on the right. So there are two possibilities. Either the P is true everywhere, or Q is true somewhere at some X. No, no, no. So what is on the left hand side? On the left hand side, you see that uh, at each point you have either P or Q. What is on the right? There is a disjunction. So if for any X, P of X is true, then we are fine. But what happens if there is some X on which P is false? Not P. We know that for any X, there should be either P or Q. And if P is false, then Q should be true. And this validates the right-hand side. So this guy is generally true. And the first one is not. Okay, does this make sense? Uh, do you understand what's happening, what's going on? Okay, no questions, so suppose that everything is fine. Okay, so uh, one CDE there go for home task and we'll discuss it next time. Um, okay, so uh, let's now try point two to A. Is dual it satisfiability? As usual, we have truth, we have satisfiability. The following formula exists x such that for all y q of x x and not q of x y how do you think is this formula well of course this formula is not uh, supposed to be generally true because it started with the existential quantifier objects could not exist uh, but uh, is this satisfiable? Could there be an interpretation for Q such that this is true? 
So there is some x, which is in the relation q with itself, but for all y, it is not in relation q with y. Equality. But okay. Again, you will have... So you suggest that q of x, y is just x equals y. So you indeed get q of x, x because x is equal to x. But the other thing says that for all y, not q of x, y. So for any y, x is not equal to y. Could this be true? So we got an object which is not equal to anything. So it eludes any equality. In particular, this object is even not equal to itself. Right? But this bad. And actually, this gives us the solution of the original problem. Because you see that maybe you got confused a bit that there were two different letters, and you tacitly implied that if there is X and Y, they should denote different objects, right? But this is not the case, basically. You can uh, use uh, different values to denote the same object. And you can say, see the following, that if for all X, for all Y, some formula holds, some A arbitrary, then this entails A of X for any X, right? Well, this is the meaning of for any, that if you have something for any Y, then it holds for any particular instance of Y, for example, X. And using this, you can, uh, imp imp here it's an implication, it's not an equivalent translation. Now you will get this. And this. And now, now let's see it, this formula on the right. Could this formula be satisfied? How do you think? Exists x such that q of x x and not q of x x. Of course, this formula is not satisfiable. Because we have just crude contradiction. We have q and not q. And then it could not exist an x, which is at the same time in relation q with itself and in not q with itself. But if we satisfied the original formula, this one, of course we should have satisfied all its corollaries, everything that follows from it. Therefore, this also not satisfiable. Okay. Does this make sense? For other formulae from two, let us postpone them to the next class for you maybe to get more acquainted with these notations. Okay, so now we have three, four, five, six. Let's ask you, which one would you wish to discuss now? So we have some, something like 20 minutes left. We will not have time to discuss all of them, but uh, let's discuss some of them. Which one would, would you want to discuss now? Okay, if no preferences, then I would like to tr start maybe with five. Uh, it's fun, and uh, I hope that you will do some of at least some of this yourself. Okay, 5a. How do you express the fact that a reflection a relation is reflexive? Do you know what a reflexive relation is? A relation is reflexive if each element is in this reflection with itself. So say x less trivial than y. It's reflexive because x is always less trivial than x. You can graphically represent it like this. For any element, it's in the relation with itself. How can this be written down as a formula in our, in our logic? The fact that something is reflexive. Relation R is reflexive. Mm -hmm. For any x, q of, not qr, it was denoted by r here. 
It's not, no, yeah, in, in the formulation here, it's R, it's not Q. For all X, R of X, X. Great, yeah, this is true. Okay, so transitivity. Who wants to do transitivity? Transitivity means the following, that if you have a point and it is connected to another one, and like this, then there is also this arrow here. How do you implement transitivity? To know this point, this will be x, this will be y, and this will be z. Yes, for any of these guys, then I will write this down for you. So, um, transitivity, so it means that for any x, y, and z, if r of x, y, and r of x, z, y, z, then r of x, z. It is a dual to a density which we discussed in the lecture today. So this is transitivity. So this is reflexivity. And this is transitivity. Okay, so well, let's let's finish that. What to, what means for a relation to be symmetric? Symmetric in uh, graphical representation means that if we can go from x to y by r, then we can go back. Okay, someone already wrote this down. Yes, exactly. I will write it down also on the Jamboard. Uh, that for any x, y again, r of x, y implies r of y, x. And this is symmetry. So, uh, for the last one, which is anti-symmetry, okay, I will just write down the correct answer here, because this is a matter of uh, some uh, terminology. Uh, what you wanted to say is that if you, anti-symmetry means that it's not symmetric in the sense that never symmetric. So it means that it should be Rxy implies not Ryx. But by definition of anti-symmetry, you are allowed to be reflexive. And this is represented as follows. Let me say it now. Anti-symmetry. Uh, it says the following, that for again, for all x, y, of course, if r of x, y and r of y, x, then x equals y. So here, unfortunately, you cannot express that without uh, saying that, uh, without using uh, equality as an extra predicate symbol. So formally speaking, equality also is a predicate symbol, so you could write it like this. And with equality, this is expressible. Without equality, you cannot express it, because Without equality, you could have clusters. You could have objects which uh, see each other, say x and x prime, and they are, if you don't have equality, you don't know whether it is the same object or it is, uh, there are two copies of it. And therefore, anti-symmetry is expressible only in the presence of equality. This is an uh, important thing, and therefore I decided to sort of like that. Okay. Mm, so, uh, also let us maybe try, let us try point four up here. Okay. Point four, that um, here we have a concrete interpretation on natural numbers, so R of A, B, means that A is less than B. 
And the question is uh, how to express the following. U equals U plus one equals V. How can you express it using the order? The set is natural numbers. So what does it mean to be uh, the next element in terms of order? What is uh, u plus 1 with respect to u? So first, what you can write about v just from the first glance. If you have this uh, greater, a, a greater or, b or less than b or something like that. R of uv, right. So first you can say that u is less than v or r of uv. But this is not sufficient because there are many v's that are greater than u. And we have to find u plus 1, which is the immediate next one. Can we say r uh, uh, v u plus 2? We don't have plus 2. Would we, the only symbol we have is less. We don't have anything else. We don't have plus two, we don't have plus, we don't have two. But, okay, we have many v's which are greater than u. And what is the specific property of u plus one? Among these v's. Maybe you could recall the to today's lecture. Uh, you remember that today we discussed uh, dense orders, right? So the order on n is not dense. What does it mean? So what is the specific? Okay, I'm okay, maybe we could write draw this on the on the natural number line. So here we have u, here we have v, and this is v equals u plus one. Okay, and another situation is when here is natural numbers, here is u, and here is some v which is greater, but it's far away. What is the difference between these two situations? I even wrote down this hint here, Draw, drawn it on the natural line. Yes, exactly. There does not exist any x between u and v. So it's u less than v and there does not exist an, does not exist an x such that between yes, u less than x and x less than v. And you can rewrite this in terms of that's it so we use non-density by the way if instead of n we, we consider z it's also fine but if we consider real or rational numbers this fails and it fails that it's not expressible because if you have rational line and you have the order you can shrink it or extend it so you can apply affine transformations you can multiply everything by two and the order is the same but uh, plus one fails so this is only for discrete situation like that okay so any questions by now on this topic on the home tasks any of them please okay then if there are no questions then I think that at this point we could actually finish by today because, uh, well, we could consider other problems if you wish. If you want, just please uh, indicate this and we'll do this. Uh, but if not, then uh, other questions from this exercise sheet will be left for you for home thinking and also understanding of this notation. Notation is quite easy and uh, most of you who learned some mathematics, they should be familiar with that. But uh, this requires some uh, understanding. Another home task which is still there is to co construct a say, better example for the problem 9 of the first exercise sheet. 
As we've seen in our examples, well, it was formally correct, but there was a problem that uh, the new clauses added to the CNF, they were actually weaker than the clauses that were already in the conjunctive normal form. And one could say, okay, the algorithm could just rule this out in an easy fashion and this will be okay. So um, the question is to construct really a working example for which no such problems will be there and will still give exponential growth. Such examples exist because otherwise we'll get all these uh, big prizes uh, for proving P equals NP. Because if such example does not exist, it means that there will be an algorithm for solving satisfiability of three CNF in polynomial time, which is highly unlikely uh, due to the uh, theory of uh, NP and NP. So next time we'll have uh, Turing machines as the generic computation model, both on the lecture and on the seminar, and also, so the lecture will be given by Alexei Delambuza uh, in the same hybrid format as usual. Uh, so for the class, we'll have two parts. The first one will be about, so we'll start with, of course, uh, finishing this sheet on predicate logic first order. As I said, we do not stop on first order logic for a long time. We just a uh, small grasp of that. Then we'll do Turing machines and a bit of graphs. And uh, so uh, in two weeks, there will be graph theory in both lectures and seminars. And uh, we have five minutes left. If there are no questions, then we'll finish right now.